Uh, to those of you who are coming in, welcome to this virtual author visit with the Lincoln Public Library. All right. So for those of you who have not joined us for a virtual author visit before, welcome. We are so excited you're joining us today. Um, just to give you all a little bit of a layout of how we're going to use all the tools in Zoom for today's conversation. Uh, we do have both the chat and the question and answer um, options available. Um, please use if there is something that you would like our fantastic author Dana and I to discuss today, a question you would like answered, please use the Q&A. That's the easiest place for us to keep track of it. You can drop your questions in at any point um, during the conversation. We will go through most of them at the end, but one or might get integrated in as we're talking. Um, you can use the chat if you want to give a shout out. If you're joining us from outside Lincoln, you want to share where you're at, you just want to um, do something that isn't a direct question, you're more than welcome to use the chat for that. But yeah, please do use that Q&A for any questions you'd like answered. All right, so we're just past the top of the hour and don't see a lot of people streaming in. So anybody can still join us as they log in, but we'll go ahead and get started. So again, welcome. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Katherine Hunt and I am lucky enough to be the director of the Lincoln Public Library. And I'm very excited to welcome you all to the last virtual author visit for 2021. Our next one will be in 2022. Um, and this is a very exciting author visit. We have with us uh, Dana L. Davis, who is a fantastic author. I'm so excited to get to talk with you for the next little bit. Um, but in addition to all of the great things that I'm going to mention about her, um, her book, Roman and Jewel, is also one of our Battle of the Book selections. So if you haven't heard of our Battle of the Books program, it is a teen reading trivia challenge. Um, and so teens are invited to make teams come together. We have selected five titles for them to read from. And in February, we will be having a trivia match uh, with details from the different books for everyone to buy to see how closely they read them and be crowned the champion for our first ever battle of the books. You get your name on it, your team name, I should say, on an eternal trophy that will be kept in the library. You get rewards if you win and for placing as well as for participating. And we're so excited um, that Roman Jewel is one of our selections and to get to talk to Dana today about her great work. So if you are a teen and you're not part of Battle of the Books, head to our website to sign up. If you know a teen who's not part of Battle of the Books, send them to our website to sign up because it's going to be a lot of fun. And so with that, we have with us Dana L. Davis, who is uh, a young adult author, um, Roman and Jewel, which I mentioned is in fact her third novel. Uh, she's also an accomplished actress uh, on screen as well as doing voice acting and voice work. Um, and she's a screenwriter, a trained musician, a motivational speaker, and runs a fantastic nonprofit in Los Angeles that secures tickets for um, performing arts shows around LA for kids in disadvantaged neighborhoods and coming from places of hardship. And so thank you for joining us, Dana. It's so great to have you. Hey, I'm excited. Thanks for having me. So I was wondering, um, you know, we'll talk across your body of work, but one of the titles we're very interested in, of course, with Bella Books is Roman and Jewel. And I was wondering whether you could give us a little bit of what that book is about for anyone who hasn't had a chance to read it. Sure. Okay. Uh, Roman and Jewel is about a, a young girl uh, who, her name is Jersey James, and she is a phenom. She is an amazing singer, and she is um, about to make her Broadway deb debut. She's auditioning for a Broadway show, and she is being narrowed down to their last final choices. And sort of on the eve of them making their selection of who's going to be the lead in this new musical, which is sort of like a Hamilton style of uh, Romeo and Juliet, sort of like a retelling. Um, she finds out that the producers of the show want to hire someone who's very famous. And so she, even though she's the best for the job, gets cast as the understudy to this uh, famous singer. And so um, as the understudy, she falls for the lead boy in the show. And that's basically sort of a brief overview of Roman and Joel. That's fantastic. 
Um, and so this is coming out of a deep place of love for you as a novel, because your background so much is in musical theater and Broadway and in stage performance, correct? Absolutely. Well, not Broadway, in my Broadway. dream. <laughs> in my dream, for sure. But yeah, I started doing theater when I was seven years old. <clears throat> so I did my first play when I was seven. And um, I just did plays in, in musical theater all the way up until I was 18. And I graduated from, from high school moved to Los Angeles, majored in music in college, um, still did theater. Um, you know, I started acting. And so, yeah, when I, I didn't start my writing career until much later, like when I was in my thirties. So it was really exciting for me for my third book to sort of combine um, my writing and my love of acting. So this is, this is a really exciting book for me to write. So with that, you say your writing career came a little bit later. We're always interested um, in how people come to writing their novels. So what, what brought you to writing? Well, it's interesting because as an actor, I really, um, how can I put this? I felt sad with the types of roles that were being offered to me. So as a Black woman, I felt like the roles weren't, weren't actually characters. They were caricatures of like, what people thought black people were like and um i really felt like they were so stereotypical and so negative and just not at all representative of like who i was or who i am as a black woman who my mom is my aunts my cousins like i mean i grew up like watching you know listening to les mis and like my favorite actor was colm wilkinson who like he starred in les mis and i was such a theater nerd and i had my little viola and i was like walking to school and I loved acapella music and show choir and I just felt like when they when they had a black woman she was nothing that I recognized and so I got tired of complaining about it I was like what can we do like about the way that black women and black men just black people in general are represented in film and tv and books and also and with books honestly I just didn't even see me you know um, represented at all and so I got tired of complaining about it. I was like, I don't want to complain anymore. I want to be that the change that I wish to see in the world. And so I decided what better way to start than by writing um, stories for, for young people so that they can grow up and see themselves. And it's so important for like your self-esteem, um, seeing versions of you in books that you're reading and in shows that you're watching. So this was sort of the beginning for me um, of like saying, hey, I'm not going to complain anymore. I'm going to be the change I wish to see in the world. Absolutely. Well, and I know that you've written an article for a fantastic organization that works um, towards these same ends. We need diverse books, which encourages people to not only write um, diverse stories and stories that reflect lived experience, but also um, encourage and put pressure on institutions like publishing houses and libraries to make sure that we're purchasing, displaying, and centering, um, you know, books, especially for young people, but for all ages that do reflect the real experience of the Black community, of communities of color, of different communities that don't always find themselves actually having mirrors in popular culture. Absolutely. So, I mean, yeah, I call it normalizing the Black experience, right? We have <laughs> so many books, or so many stories just in general that deal with like the hardships of, of being Black. And, and that's important. It's really important. But also like we're falling in love, we're arguing with our parents, you know, we're, we're fighting with our siblings, like we're just living, we're just having a human, human experiences. So I think it's important that those stories um, come to the front too, you know, they're important. Absolutely. And being engaged in musical theater, which I know in many places is a, it's a very white space. It's not necessarily a space that is always super open to the black community and communities of color and people of color. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's sad. A lot of people ask me, you know, when you graduated from high school, what made you come to LA versus Broadway? And I always say, sadly, I didn't see myself um, on Broadway. Like the shows that were playing on Broadway when I graduated high school um, didn't have me in them. They didn't have any black girls. And I just didn't feel like there was a place for me. Uh, whereas I felt like I'd have a better shot um, in Los Angeles dealing with commercials and there just felt like more options. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's great that we have a lot more musicals that are diverse. It's, it's beautiful actually, 
but it's it's been a long time coming. It hasn't always been like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and it was interesting because you mentioned um, when you were describing kind of the plot of Roman and Jewel saying it's a little bit of a, a Hamilton style recreation of Romeo and Juliet at the center. And I thought that was interesting because one of the things that I find wonderful about Hamilton is not just that it is the casting of Black actors and actors of color, which is great and important, but I also feel like it really centralizes the artistic and musical traditions of the Black community into it. Um, yeah. And so I, th I think that's really great, especially with uh, Romeo and Juliet, which is Shakespeare, which is, you know, often so very much taught as this kind of stodgy, you know, British guy who wrote, and how do we continue to make that relevant and meaningful? Um, were you excited to work with the, with the material of Shakespeare and kind of do this, do this revamping of it and reimagining of it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just like I said before, like, it's so it's so important to normalize the black experience right and we have these stories that are amazing like Shakespeare stories and we want to keep these stories alive because they're so important um, because they're just so beautiful and we want to keep them alive but how can we do it in a way where we're inclusive right and we're in, we're including um, um, more you know different types of people and so it felt exciting for me because I I mean Romeo and Juliet is one of my favorite stories. And if somebody's doing Romeo and Juliet, I'm going to watch it, read it, whatever, whatever it is. I think I've seen every like movie of Romeo and Juliet out there. Um, so yeah, I was excited to, to um, make it, con like to connect it to Black culture and, um, and also to musical theater. So yeah. So what is it about Romeo and Juliet? When you said that, you know, you'll go and you'll see it as one of your favorites. What is it about that story that you really love? Well, I think it's like the insta love. I think there's something really magical about insta love because there's something, I mean, life is beautiful, but life is also like very mundane, right? Like sometimes when you feel like you're on, it's like Groundhog Day. I don't know if, um, a lot, not a lot of kids have heard of that movie, but it's basically a movie where, a guy wakes up and he's reliving the same day over and over and over in the, like the exact same way. And sometimes it feels it feels like that, um, the mundaneness of life. But then there's that love, you know, that overpowering love that you look at someone and it's just like all consuming and to the point where, I mean, you do crazy things, right? These two kids did some crazy things. And so I think I think I'm really drawn to that because it takes you out of the mundane and brings that passion to like such a high level. Um, so I think that's why I've always been drawn to it. And that, that yeah, as you mentioned, that insta-love, um, this kind of immediate love and infatuation with each other as, as a plot device is a significant part of Roman and Jewel. And that, that harkens back from the Romeo and Juliet kind of material. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I, it's, it's, so, it's so great because I, I have a book coming out um, next year. I, can you hear that loud, um, <laughs> that loud truck? Sorry about that. Um, let me know if you have any trouble hearing me. But um, I have a book coming out next year and we wanted to make sure that the, the friendship built before the love came in. And so I worked really hard to have like 200 pages of like friendship and then we got to the love stuff. I love that in Roman and Jewel, they fall in love right away. I love that moment in the bathroom where they're just sort of, or well, actually this happens in the stairwell where there's just like such chemistry. I mean, it was so fun to write and just live in, and live in that space. So it's very cool. <laughs> well, that's one of the fun things about um, both YA and kind of romance novels is getting to work through these kind of tropes and these ideas. I mean, you know, 200 pages, oh, it's a fantastic slow burn romance, but in this there's that insta love and getting to getting to play out and play with how characters are affected by those different models, which yeah, a lot of times are more exaggerated than a lot of what our daily lives are, but that's part of the fun of literature is. Exactly, escapism for sure, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Um, so with that, you mentioned a little bit of this of coming into writing to kind of write the stories to normalize the Black experience, to bring forward the characters that um, you wanted to see in literature and in the world. How different is it though to be writing a character versus you know, your process that you do a lot of the time, which is bringing life 
to someone else's character? Is it, how, how was that shift as you moved into writing? You know, it's very, it's very similar, I think, um, living in that headspace. And you know, what's funny is I'm, I'm 43 years old, um, but as an actor, I played a 16 year old until I was 33. <laughs> and so it felt, and that's, that's when I started writing was at the age of 33. So playing a, a teenager in so many movies and in so many TV shows and commercials, it felt just like such a simple thing to transition into writing teenagers. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like the process is very, is very similar, just getting into that mindset. And it really does take over you. Like you become so connected to these characters, so emotional. I mean, there's times when I'm writing where I'm, you know, I'm crying, I'm sobbing, I'm angry too. Um, but it's also, it's, it's exciting to be able to, to escape into these characters too. Like who gets to do that? It's, it's, um, it's a lot of fun. So. Absolutely. Do your characters surprise you a lot of the time as you're writing? Yeah, because for me, it's a very like, um, I don't know, magical realism, because I really feel like I'm in the story. And I'm like looking around and seeing what would happen and how it would happen. And so I do feel like the characters like take a life of their own and, and guide me. I know that sounds like super <laughs> out there. Instead of me guiding them, there comes a point where that happens. And even if I wanted to do like this, I can't because it just feels contrary to what the character would do or say. I always ask that question because you said it sounds crazy, but so often we do hear from authors that, yeah, that, you know, once you kind of really build out this fully fleshed character, there are things that they just wouldn't do the same way that a real person, if it said, oh, so-and-so went into that, you'd be like, no, no, that, that's not, that's not what they would do. And that a lot of times the story evolves with that. Um, how much do you plan your plots kind of beforehand or how much do you just kind of follow where your characters want to take you? Well, I kind of, you know, when I started as a writer, my first, uh, my first book was Tiffany Sly Lives Here Now. And so I really had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> and so I was definitely sort of pantsing my way through that where I was just sort of figuring it out as I went along. Um, who is Tiffany Sly? What's happening? But I think as I, like by the time I did the voice in my head, I had be a type of author who plots plots the story out. In fact, when I sold um, the voice in my head, I only sold it with the first three chapters and a detailed like outline of what happens in every in every chapter. And um, now I'm 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 sort of branching off into screenwriting, and so I'm learning um, the beats of screenwriting. They call them they call them beats. Um, and so I actually use that too in my writing as an author because I like the screenwriting beats. And so, um, yeah, I'm very much a big plotter and um, it takes me a while. I probably say like, if I'm starting a new story, it takes me about three months um, to plot it out. That's, that's fantastic. And screenwriting. So this is kind of coming full circle for you with being, working with scripts and then writing. And now you are writing scripts themselves. Yeah, I'm really excited about it. Um, it's, it's, it's brand new. I have a screenwriting partner and we've been working on something for about, I'd say about a year. Um, and so hopefully next year I'll have some exciting news to share. So it'll be cool. We will, we will keep an eye out for that because yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you. Fantastic. So one of the cool things, and we talked a little bit about this before we started the webinar is um, with Roman and Jewel, you actually can listen to one of the songs that is talked about in the book. So can you tell us a little bit about um, that song and where it fits in the book and how this recording came to be? Sure, yeah. Um, so much fun. It's, it's called I Think I Remember. And basically, this is the moment in the book where, um, it, well, there's a story within the story, right? So there's the, the play, the musical that's going on. And in this musical, um, the characters link up at you know a party and they they seem very familiar there's a theme in roman and jewel of um reincarnation right so the story within the story deals deals with that a lot more than the actual story um and so they sing this song which is basically like why do you seem so familiar 
so familiar to me? Why does it feel like I know you? Like, I think I remember you, even though I'm meeting you for the first time. And so when this book came out, unfortunately, we were, we were, I think we were like in a quarantine still, um, going through a lot with, with the pandemic and still trying to figure out like what COVID was and how to handle it. And so there were no, there were no book events happening. And so I thought, well, what a great thing to do to sort of write a song and like release it on YouTube uh, to kind of go along with um, the book release. And Broadway was also shut down. So it was like really um, quite sad for Broadway to be dark for so long because of COVID, it was like really heartbreaking. So we did the song sort of like a tribute to Broadway. Um, and also it's mentioned in the book, it's the song that they sing, um, it's, their, it's their first kiss. So it's, it's really cool. It's got, you can look it up on YouTube, yeah, and watch. It's got, I think, I think I remember, yeah. That's fantastic. That is something that I, I saw when I was going through that this was published in January of this year, um, which was still in the midst of all of, well, we're still in the midst of COVID, but in the midst of the shutdowns, in the midst of COVID and trying to figure that out. Um, how much of this was written before we started seeing things close down? Was it all written before and going through editing as COVID kind of took hold? It was, oh gosh, the book started before COVID took hold and then a lot of the shaping took place during all that madness, which was actually like a beautiful thing for me because it was so chaotic in the real world and I feel like I got to escape to like this beautiful love story. And a lot of people weren't working as well, but I was working hard trying to get my edits done. So I was really busy um, during that time in quarantine. And so um, it ended up being like a very special time for me, like escaping into this love story and, and being able to like sort of um, put out of my mind all the nightmare that was happening in the world um, and just escape it a little bit, even though, I mean, I couldn't fully escape it, but it just was a nice um, thing. It's a nice memory of writing the book, so. It was a Absolutely. very quiet space, yeah. Well, and with that, you know, I think sometimes watching that and realizing that some of the things that we all took so much for granted, things like um, like going to theater and being able to come together and, you know, if you're in theater doing rehearsals and doing it in person, um, all of a sudden realizing that that's not necessarily as stable as we thought it was, that there were things that could happen. And I mean, do you see this a little bit also as kind of a love letter to theater in the midst of all that? To theater and to New York as well. I mean, New York is like my favorite city and um, I love escaping into this world because it's that New York that you know I grew up loving so much, You know, whereas things have changed so dramatically. I think in every big city it's changed so dramatically. Um, but yes, definitely um, to New York, a love letter to New York and, and to theater as well. Theater. And of course, these fantastic young people who are in it and going through, going through um, all the excitement of the novel, which is great. Um, so you mentioned growing up musical theater. Um, what, what are some of your favorite um, shows? What are some of your favorite plays? Oh gosh, um, there's so many that I love. I think it sounds so cliche, everyone says this, but uh, Les Mis is one of my favorite. It's just one of those musicals that like, if you feel like crying, Les Mis is a good one to, <laughs> to listen to um, because the, the songs are just so emotional and you know, the characters, Fantine, Cosette, they all just go through so much and they're just like dying and it's, sickness and sadness and it's a good I used to actually listen to Les Mis before I had an audition where I had to cry I was like let me just put Les Mis in my ear go in sobbing it's easy um probably uh, Miss Saigon uh Into the Woods uh The Wiz I got to play Dorothy in The Wiz when I was in high school um I like them all <laughs> but I think uh, I know I mentioned Jersey's favorite was Cabaret and Cabaret is definitely one of my one of my favorites. Um, I found that on accident, my family would go uh, getting, like, we, back in the day, back in the olden days, <laughs> we would go get VHS, you know, nothing was streaming. And so my family would get all the cool movies, like, I don't know, whatever, Star Wars, E.T. And I would like be in the art section and I found Cabaret. And I just remember like being so mesmerized with Liza Minnelli's voice and 
just being this little kid who's just like staring at the screen while my family's like watching ET in the other room. Um, so yeah, I've always just had such a deep love for, for theater, for musical theater. I love that you mentioned the, the video or the film version of Cabaret. That was definitely, I think, probably the first musical that I knew growing up. I didn't even know that it was a musical. You know, I didn't have that language for it, but absolutely, absolutely loved it. And yeah, also pre-streaming, pre-DVDs, getting the VHS, you know, yeah. you could rent those from real stores. Yeah, it's crazy. My daughter's never even seen like a VHS type. I don't even think she would know what it is. I showed it to her. <laughs> <laughs> my my favorite version of that with old technology is some some meme went around on the internet of someone holding a floppy disk and that their their child's response had been why did someone 3d print the save icon <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> um so were you also a big reader growing up was that another thing that was one of your loves yeah, I was a big reader. And that that's another thing that sort of guided me to be a writer because when I was younger, I loved reading like the Babysitter's Club and I loved reading um, Christopher Pike and just things that were a little bit lighter and more fun. Um, but there were never stories like that that had black characters in them. The black books were very heavy, very sad. And I just would always not want to read those. I, I was like, I've had enough sadness for the day. I want to read the Babysitter's Club book 14. <laughs> or Sweet Valley Twins was another one. I mean, I could get through those books in like a day. And there were just so many of them. They never ended. Um, just fun stories. So um, so yeah, I was I was a big reader. But I think it did, it was, it was sad looking back on it because I think it did do some some damage on a lot of young black kids because we just never saw ourselves represented in those books and um thankfully we're we're writing those wrongs so that's really cool and absolutely yeah that those kind of very fun friendship focused light and yeah a little bit escapist which i think is is a great thing i know sometimes lighter literature doesn't get as much respect or acknowledgement, but I think there's a lot to be said for the way that literature can bring and create joy and that doesn't need to just echo the things that are difficult or just give us language for things that are difficult. That absolutely, yeah. Especially, especially, you know, in situations where you don't have a lot of control over making things better, sometimes just having something that brings that joy can be incredibly healing and sustaining. That's so true. I love how you said that. Yeah. Um, so with that, you mentioned a lot of these that are big series. Are you thinking of doing a series at some point or are you enjoying doing standalones? I am thinking of doing a series. In fact, that's the new the newest book that I'm working on. It's a series. Um, so I'm excited about that. I can't talk about it yet. But <laughs> got like, a, well, yeah, I'll just say it's going to be a, a YA series. Very fun. Very mysterious. Wow. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Like, that's great because series books are, especially with YA, I know we see this in the library. Um, we see that people get invested in a world and in characters and they want to keep coming back to them. They want to see what happens next. They build almost friendships with these characters. So that's an exciting next step with that. Thanks. Yeah, I'm very excited about it. So to keep an eye peeled for, send, send us the update when that. Okay, right. projects talkable. Oh. <laughs> For sure. I'll be delighted to see that. Um, let's see what I've got. So you also run a nonprofit. You do everything. As I was reading the bio, I was just like, you do, you do everything. I try. <laughs> I try. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about your nonprofit and how it came to be and the kind of work that it does? Yeah, I think um, one of the things that made me really sad growing up um, when I would connect to people of my culture because they didn't know a lot about the fact that there were job opportunities um, in this field, like music, musical theater, theater. Um, they didn't know a whole lot about theater. I mean, it just was sort of like not even on their radar. And I thought, how sad. I mean, it's one thing if you dislike something and you're like, I, I've experienced it. I don't like it. But if you've never experienced it, I mean, we're missing these beautiful opportunities um, for these kids. Um, and so I wanted to present it to, I like the way you said, like children who are in disadvantaged communities who don't 
their parents are not going to take them to the Pantages Theater in Los Angeles. I mean, the tickets there is like $150. I mean, Hamilton, I love it so much, but like it cost me $400 to go see Hamilton. I had to go alone <laughs> because no one else <laughs> wanted to pay that much money. And so with this nonprofit, we don't just take them to the theater, but we also go into the classroom. Um, we teach them about the music. Uh, we teach them about the job opportunities within the show. We show them the orchestra pits, um, the crew, what you know, the lighting. There's so many things that they don't know about, and we like to present it to them, to introduce it to them. Um, and so it's it's more than just seeing shows; it's understanding like the intricacies of how a show runs, um, and in an effort to inspire them and guide them as they go like on their journey and their path and choose careers and that sort of thing because the industry is, is, is on, I wouldn't say completely void, but there aren't a lot of um, black, blacks in these positions, in these, um, in these orchestra pits, in, in these shows backstage, because they just, it was never exposed to them. They didn't even know it was an option. Yeah, you can't, you can't envision a future that includes things that you've never heard of or never seen. Exactly. Um, and I love your discussion of all of the people that the orchestra pit backstage, because theater is, it's a community that makes the lights turn on on the people who are actually on the stage. And I think that's great because not everyone imagines themselves in a leading role, but that doesn't mean that they are not, that they don't love and wouldn't be incredible voices to have in the field. Yeah, it's so, it's such a beautiful thing. So much talent. I mean, one of my favorite scenes in, in Roman and Jewel is when Jersey walks into the rehearsal room for the first time and you've got the choreographers there, you've got the director, the music director. Um, and it's just so, that's such a cool moment when you do, when you are a part of a production because everyone is so important and everyone is so gifted. Um, and it's just exciting. You're just in awe of everything around you. And it's amazing to see how many people are there to, to make this thing happen, you know? Absolutely. How many people are committed? Yeah. And everyone is so important. Like we couldn't do it without that, you know, particular, like without the costumes, the show's not going to happen. Mm. You know, things like that. Absolutely. Well, and on this line, we do have a question from Kendra, who's wondering what you would recommend to a young person who is thinking of exploring singing or performing. Well, you know, this was not a thing when I was growing up, but now they have so many outlets with, um, with social media, like TikTok and Instagram and YouTube. I would say definitely start, you know, start a YouTube channel, start a TikTok channel. If you're old enough, of course, I don't know the, my daughter's 10 and she's always like, mom, can I do YouTube? And I'm like, no, <laughs> no way. But if you're old enough, I think it's a really amazing way to connect to other people too. Um, and just, you know, start getting used to performing and singing. And I mean, isn't that how Justin Bieber got discovered? I think he was like on YouTube singing or something like that. I don't know. Um, <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, I know if it's not Justin Bieber, I know there's plenty of people who have gotten their start off of social media or band camp or these kind of low barrier, um, direct to community kind of creator platforms. Right. Absolutely. And I think too, like, there's so many local theaters that you can you can join. Um, there's so many classes you can take. My daughter's 10 and she takes a composition class. So she's learning how to write music, um, learning how to, to edit. I mean, just looking online, there's just like a plethora of like classes where you can sort of start learning. Doesn't matter your age, doesn't even actually matter now where you're at because you can take the class online. So I would say just like do some research and, um, you know, take one small step. I like that. I like that idea of one small step because I know sometimes it feels like you've got to get from beginning to mastery overnight. It does feel like that. It really does. <laughs> um, I suppose in a similar vein, you know, so you've been writing for a number of years now. This is your third um, novel. Do you have any advice for the writers in the group who maybe aren't going on stage, but, you know, do have stories to tell? Yeah, I would say um, there's all sorts of things, too, that you can get involved with. Um, there's writing retreats. 
Um, and again, some of these retreats, they're online, so you could join them. Um, you could start your own writing retreat, you know, where you're getting together with friends and you're just sort of doing writing prompts and writing about what's going on. Um, I would say, like, start telling stories, start writing little stories and and asking your friends and your family to read them. That's how I started. I would write, like, a little story and, and say to my mom, like, hey, mom, would you mind reading this? Or even to, like, a friend. And um, it's just it's just kind of fun. Like, you don't have to present something to the world for it to be relevant and important. You can just present it to a small group and um, get feedback or even just have them say, hey, that was really cool. I enjoyed reading it. And that's sort of a place to start. Absolutely. I like I like that idea that it doesn't necessarily have to go. Something doesn't have to be seen by everyone to be meaningful. Absolutely. You know, there are people, there's people around you that want to hear the stories that you have in you. Yeah, my friends and I do something. Um, we get together like once a month and um, we call it a saloon where we all just sort of you know, one person goes up and talks to the group and tells what stories in their head. Um, so here's my idea. And you tell it to, you know, the group and we, we, um, we eat, we eat pizza and drink sodas. And we just talk about the stories that are in our head and we get comments and feedback. Um, and we're also going to start doing it where people are performing. So like bring your guitar, sing a song because we, we want to perform because it makes us feel good. Like, and sometimes I think we get into our head that we have to be famous and we have to be singing for the world where it's like, you can also bless just a small group of people, you know, and enjoy that. And that, that still builds, builds your skills and builds the community. I know, you know, we see a lot of discussion about kind of the hustle and that every hobby, you know, well, if you work hard at it, you can make money at it. And that's important, but you can also do things for the love of them. If, you know, if you have the room and time to do that. Absolutely. Um, just for like your, your spirit, like it just feels good. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love that. I love the saloon. That, that is fantastic. Yeah, it's really cool. Has that been, how long has that been going on? Oh, I, I, it's a, it's, it's held by a friend of mine. So they started doing it years ago and I, I joined in maybe a year and a half ago, but I think they've been doing it for about five years. That's brilliant. Mm -hmm. That's a brilliant model that, you know, anybody, anybody could do. Absolutely. Start with a friend group. So I suppose, let me see where we've got in our question and answer. I know one of my questions, as I mentioned, Roman and Jewel is going to be part of our trivia contest. I was wondering if there is a question about that book that you think would be a great trivia question. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> if there's a D or maybe this is better to say, is there a detail about the book that you really love that you're not sure that everybody sees? <laughs> um. I'd have to think about that one for a little bit. Um, so many tiny things. We just talked about like what's what was Jersey's favorite. I probably would ask that even though we just talked about it, which is what is Jersey's favorite musical or why? Why does Jersey love performing? Like what? Why does she want to be on Broadway? Um, because sometimes I think there's like it feels like a narcissistic element to like performers. Like, why do you want to be on stage? Because you want people to cheer for you? Um, <laughs> but it's, it's deeper than that. And I think we do get into it in, um, in Roman and Joel. So that might be a question. Like, why does Jersey like performing? I think that's a fantastic one. <laughs> and I think the fact that we've discussed it a little bit is it's not, it's not a bad idea. It means any of our Battle of the Book contestants who've joined us today have a little bit of a, a little bit of an edge. Yeah. <laughs> so let's see. I do see that in our audience, we do have one hand up, John. So John, I'm going to go ahead and turn on your mic so you can ask uh, your question. So John, if you want to unmute, you can ask your question whenever you're ready. Okay, there was a conversation earlier, and you, uh, Dana was talking about a, a YouTube video, uh, and I, I didn't get the title. Oh, hi, John. Um, I think I remember. That's the name of the, That's the name of the song. 
So if you Googled or if you went on YouTube and typed in, I think I remember space Roman and Jewel, it would come up. And one of the things we can do as well, uh, this um, talk is being recorded. We'll go ahead and make sure that we include a link to that when we post the recording of this. We can also throw um, a link to that on our Facebook and social media, the standard places where you guys might have found the link for this event. So that you guys can all go and see that without having to search for it. Sounds good. All right. So let's see if you've got any other questions uh, from our audience, please go ahead and drop them in the Q&A. We'll be delighted to chit chat about them. Otherwise, Dana, I know you've mentioned a couple of the things that you've got in the works. You've got a screenplay project. You've got another book project that we can't talk about. What else is on the horizon for you? Um, I just was able to uh, share that I have a two book deal with um, Skyscape, which is Amazon Publishing. So I have a book coming out in fall of 2022 called um, Somebody That I Used to Know. And it's about a young virtuoso um, violinist who is uh, applying to attend Juilliard School of Music. And on the eve of her like big audition prep, all the things that she's doing to audition for Juilliard, her ex-best friend shows back up. And her ex-best friend just so happens to be the most famous recording artist in the world. And so um, that's the story. Somebody that I used to know, it'll be out next fall. Fantastic. Now this is another topic that's near and dear to your heart because you're trained as a violinist yourself, correct? A violist. A violist. Not nearly as cool as the violinist, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I started playing viola when I was 10, maybe, maybe younger, no, eight and um, played all through college. Oh, that's fantastic. Now, viola is a beautiful instrument. I know it doesn't get quite as much uh, <laughs> popular notice as the violin, but um, yeah, yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful piece. Well, that's exciting. We'll keep an eye out for that. And you said it's a two book deal. So is there a sequel to that one planned or is it a separate, <laughs> um, separate yeah, title? It's, yeah, it's a separate book that um, I just started working on. I have so many, I think I'm simultaneously working on like three or four books right now. So I'm trying to manage it all. <laughs> I was going to say to that point, uh, Sharon just dropped in a um, question asking with everything that you're involved in, with how diverse all of your interests and activities are, how do you keep it organized? What secrets do you have for all of us on managing that many different creative projects? Oh, well, um, I would say my secrets are like, people that email me and remind me about things because <laughs> I, I forget sometimes I get like emails from my agent that'll say hey Dana it's 12 um your auditions due at 12 did you send it already and I'm like oh shoot <laughs> I'm sending it in five minutes and I'll like set up my studio really quickly um as far as writing um just writing so much all the time like waiting till my kid goes to bed and staying up till two o'clock in the morning waking up at five to, to write um, when everyone else is watching movies sadly I'm going to be like on my computer writing um, so yeah I think uh, it's hard to manage it all and I've just got some awesome people who are like chiming in and telling me when things are due and so that that's very helpful um, I do my best <laughs> I, I appreciate your candor in mentioning things like writing when everyone else is watching movies because, you know, this work doesn't come from anywhere. It does, it does take your time and your energy and your thoughts. And, you know, you are, you are a mom, you are engaged still in your acting work and in all these projects. And I think um, it's a big testament to your belief in these stories and your love for having these stories in the world that you are managing so many projects all at once to bring these to bring these forward for the next generation. It's so important to me. I mean, I got so many amazing emails when Tiffany Sly came out from because Tiffany Sly is about anxiety. You know, it's a young teenager who's dealing with the with the fact that her world is sort of broken her heart. And as a result, she no longer, you know how like as a teenager you feel invincible. You're like, everything's going my way. 
And so, and then something happens where it doesn't go her way and she realizes she's not in charge and, and something bad could happen at any moment. And so she has this anxiety. Um, and of course I tell it with a funny voice because we have to keep living, even though we have anxiety, we have depression. So in that book, I'm normalizing mental illness. And I had so many wonderful emails from so many kids who were just like, thank you. I didn't even know what I had, but I, I, I guess it's anxiety. Thank you so much. Um, and that just warms my heart because again, like we have these, and it doesn't even matter about color, black, white. Um, but I do think that, you know, with people of color, we um, haven't been able to see those characters. And so it means so much to me. And, you know, a young virtuoso violinist, like black girl, that's a thing. <laughs> so I'm glad that I get to write about it. Um, a, a black girl on Broadway, that's a thing too. Um, and, and with the voice in my head, I loved telling the story of like, twins, identical twins, and just like what it would be like to have a built-in best friend, you know? And um, so, yeah, I, I just love it. I love telling stories. And even if even if one person is like, hey, the story means something to me, that, that means something to me. And that's really important. Absolutely. Have you seen a, re um, a resurgence in the Tiffany Sly book with COVID and with how much, how many people are dealing with anxiety? Um, in kind of the new the new world that we're in at the moment absolutely 100 percent. yes <laughs> i wish i had a longer answer to that except <laughs> just yes um and again it's you know a lot of people who have anxiety it's something that you you live with you know it's a living with anxiety and it's not something that goes away you know you have to find <laughs> a way to make peace with the fact that your mind now is like oh gosh, this could happen and then that could happen and then that could happen. And it's just like, how do we stop it? And then, you know, feeling bad about the way you're feeling too. And I love that my book helps people to not feel bad about it. That it's perfectly normal and also quite hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I think that's so important. Uh, we do have a question from an anonymous attendee. Um, going back to Roman and Jewel, they're wondering what the main message um, or thought that you'd like readers to come away with after reading it. That's such a beautiful question. Um, so many things I want people to come away from with that, but I think I think maybe the main thing is sometimes we have these dreams, right? And we want to be the best, or we want to get the part, we want to get the lead. And we think because we're not the best, because we didn't win homecoming queen, because we were just like the runner up or we didn't get the, the part, the thing that we wanted, we think that our experience is not meaningful. So I want people to walk away with like, your experience is meaning, meaningful, it's, it's, it's authentic, it's special. And um, like where you are is exactly where you're supposed to be. And there's something beautiful about getting the lead but there's something also beautiful about, you know, being the person in the play who has like a random name, like girl walking by. I mean, <laughs> that was um, one of my first jobs as, as an actor. I didn't even have a name, I, you know, I was just like girl with balloon or I don't even know. <laughs> but like looking back, those were such amazing experiences. And um, yeah, so I just want people to walk away with like your experience matters and um, it's the journey. That's the beautiful part you know, so I hope people um, get that from the story. I think that's such a beautiful thought, especially for a YA book where, you know, so often when we're teenagers, I remember it feeling so often that the stakes were so high and it was all or nothing. It was either on top of the world or, you know, it was a waste of time. And most of us are going to spend most of our lives not winning the top prize at everything. And our lives are, are still, as you mentioned, it's rich and beautiful journeys and experiences. And, you know, not, not everybody can get the lead in every, in every part and every time that you try out. And that's, that, that's not a flaw. That's, that's a feature. That's a feature of life. Absolutely. And then also to keep trying, you know, that's the thing that drives us. It's like, you know, I didn't get it this time, but I'm going to, I'm going to keep trying. There's something beautiful yeah. about not not winning. I just watched uh, King Richard. I don't know if you've seen it, the story of Venus. Yeah. And there's this heartbreaking moment where she loses this big, you know, this big match. But it, it, it ended up being something absolutely amazing and beautiful. Um, and so 
yeah, sometimes losing, it isn't losing. It's just a part of your story, you know? Mm -hmm. It's how you grow. It's how you learn. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And then come back. Well, wonderful. Well, I'm going to do a last call to our attendees for any questions. everybody a few minutes if they're typing something out. Well, and while we do that, again, Dana, I really want to thank you for coming and speaking with us. I really want to thank you for all the incredible work that you're doing. You are such an incredible champion for telling stories of the Black experience, um, making sure that people see themselves, your community sees themselves, in the world in literature um, and expanding, you know, for us in libraries, expanding collections, explain, expanding the world. And your stories have such incredibly beautiful motivations and messages from of acceptance and striving. And I think they're really, really beautiful pieces for young people in our community to have. So thank you for all that you do in making that, that come to pass because I know that it's a lot of time and energy and effort. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. It means so much to me. And thanks for having me. So this is this has been fun. <laughs> Absolutely. And so to all of our attendees, you can, of course, pick up Dana's books here at the Lincoln Public Library. Um, but if you love them as much as we do, you may want to have them for yourselves. Or I hear there's a bunch of gift giving holidays that take place this month. Um, we always recommend that you can pick those up from Face in a Book uh, out in El Dorado Hills. Uh, or any independent bookstore, bookshop.org is a great way to find your local independent bookstores. It's as easy as Amazon, but supports booksellers in our community who make things like this happen. Um, and yeah, thank you again, Dana. We really appreciate it. I hope you have a great rest of your night. Thank you. Bye, everyone.